Um, I want to talk to you today about NRM science in the city. Uh, I'm going to argue that the complexity and the challenges and the rewards of, of, it, of doing natural resource management and parts of landscape that we're kind of more used to doing, uh, used to addressing, are sort of on steroids in cities. Um, no other part of our landscape has the, the number and complexity of landholders. The intensity of, of economic demands, or of social demands and environmental demands. And, and also the complexity of often competing laws and regulations and policies. And yet the benefits of doing it right in the city are, are totally, you know, are they massive. Um, indeed, I'm going to argue that the future of, of habitable cities around the world, and in Australia in particular, um, really hinges on this kind of new conceptualisation of cities. So I want to talk about um, what I see as being a real perfect storm of ideas that are generating enormous enthusiasm for this idea of embracing nature in cities. Um, cities around the world, this is a picture of Melbourne and surrounds, <laughs> beautiful Melbourne. Um, this is Mexico City. Cities around the world are facing unprecedented challenges to maintaining basic livability. And that's driven, you know, mostly by, by exponential population growth in, in our kind of urban areas. For some people in some cities, the challenges are about having clean air for people to, to breathe and clean water for people to drink. Other cities in Australia, um, it's about trying to uh, contemplate habitability in the face of climate change. Uh, the increasingly serious threats of uh, extreme weather events, high temperatures, storms, uh, etc. But most, I'd say perhaps even all cities around the world, are really struggling with all this exponential population growth, just so many people interacting on a daily basis. How do we create cities that, are, that have ha happy people, healthy people, people who aren't anxious, stressed, disconnected? You know, healthy cities that are really focused on the well-being of people. And that's really what's driving this enthusiasm. Because there's a, a very strong but emerging body of evidence that reveals the potential of everyday nature, we like to call it, as, as part of the solution in this space. And there's been, there've been some really high profile successes. So, you know, things like the, um, the High Line in, in New York, uh, the garden cities of, of Singapore, and they've really galvanised interest among planners and, and architects and landscape designers as to best ways of incorporating nature in the very sort of fabric of a city. So I want to quickly take you through what I consider to be five really compelling reasons for, for, uh, for embracing nature in a city. And the first one is linked to the fact that nature in our cities is good for us. And um, you know, this used to be a new thing to talk about, but it seems like almost every day something else in the media is alerting to us to a new study that, that talks about another, yet another remarkable way that nature, uh, you know, in, engaging with nature is actually good for us. This all started in about mid 1980s when a guy called Roger Ehrlich found that people would recover faster from surgery in hospital if they had a view of nature from their window, and since then. Uh, there have been a truly remarkable range of studies that have showed the kind of um, array of benefits to people's health and well-being. So if you're a child and you live in a street with more nature, more street trees and more diversity of street trees, you'll have lower risk of asthma, lower risk of allergies. If your schoolyard as a child has biodiversity in it, you will have improved cognitive development. You'll have lower rates of ADHD. If you're an adult, you're less likely to die from heart disease if you're exposed to nature on a regular basis. So you'll have less, less of a risk of diabetes, of cancer. You'll sleep better. Uh, you'll have less stress and, and lower risk of poor mental health outcomes. You're more likely to live longer and have just general better health and well-being in a city with more biodiversity. And it's, it's really interesting that it's not just the green, it's not just any old tree. It's actually a lot of these particular studies that I've highlighted here are to do with biodiversity. They're to do with having diverse, and look, I, I find 
the idea that biodiversity is linked to health, a really interesting uh, question from a kind of mechanistic perspective. You know, what's really driving this? And I think there's some interesting research even at uh, the University of Adelaide looking at, I believe, soil microbia and the, and the role that it could potentially play in delivering some of these health benefits. I think there'll be a lot of research in this space in the coming years, but whatever we find to be the mechanisms, the evidence is already highly comp compelling. And people are considering, considering this as a kind of quite legitimate public health initiative. It's a relatively cheap public health initiative. And it has a whole suite of other co-benefits that I want to quickly talk about now. One of the major ones, which is really driving a lot of interest from cities around the world, is this idea that we can somehow future-proof our cities in the face of climate change. We know that cities are already warmer than their um, rural counterparts through the urban heat, line, heat island effect. And this is exacerbated by climate change. Um, cities are also threatened by you know, a suite of issues, rising sea levels, extreme storms, variable rainfall, etc. And we know that vegetation can play a key role in the delivery of services to mitigate against and also um, ad adapt to you know, uh, warming conditions. This is, this is a really interesting thermal heat image of the centre of Melbourne where you can see under the trees about 30 degrees cooler than in the middle of the road. And in fact, across the city, the city of Melbourne in their, with their urban greening strategy, urban forest strategy, believes that, and it's quite a kind of, um, you know, it's, it's relatively ambitious, but it's not out of control. They think they can actually manage an eight degrees cooling overnight in these heat wave events. These events, overnight temperatures is where are really critical to the um, mortality events that, that happen in heat waves. Eight degrees cooler, uh, that's kind of pretty compelling. You know, we can reduce peaks in stormwater and, and uh, alleviate you know, flooding events. We can, we, can reduce, we can actually reduce energy consumption in buildings um, and, you know, and sequester carbon. There was an interesting study that I, I failed to kind of put up here but that I read a couple of weeks ago about um, city greening having the potential to sequester as much carbon per unit area as tropical rainforest. And yet, um, this is a bit of research that uh, Natalie Bart and others and myself from um, conducted a couple of years ago, well, it just came out. Um, we looked at all the cities around the world, their plans to adapt to climate change, and green infrastructure came out as being a really important, the third most kind of uh, substantial investment strategy for cities. But practically no city actually mentions biodiversity in that context. So I think we're on the cusp of, of, of a very big missed opportunity if we don't jump on this bandwagon and make sure that urban greening happens in a way that is compatible with other uh, natural resource management objectives. And this is really important from a biodiversity perspective because cities, we know, can be hotspots for threatened species. This is a study that we conducted uh, a couple of years ago that looked at urban versus rural areas. And we found that there are about three times the number of threatened species per unit area in cities as there are in the equivalent kind of rural areas. Some species are completely restricted to cities, like this is the poor old Frankston spider orchid. Uh, other species are just dependent on cities for resources. And in fact, kind of have moved into cities due to the lack of resources elsewhere in the landscape. But, you know, it's, it's what, is, what is definitely true is that cities and our actions in cities to conserve threatened species are going to be the, the, um, the survival or otherwise of a whole bunch of, of threatened species. So that, in my opinion, they are totally justifiable places for doing conservation, even for its own sake. The fourth um, compelling reason, this is my kids a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, um, in a grassland around Melbourne, is this idea that we can re-enchant people with nature. We all know about this, uh, you know, the extinction of experience, the fact that people spend less and less time outdoors um, in more and more depauperate environments. You know, adults who can name hundreds of company logo logos but only recognise a few sort of bird calls. Um, and I, I think that creating opportunities for these everyday doses of nature in cities is one of our best chances. In fact, I'd say it's an unparalleled chance to, to re-enchant people with nature. 
and to deliver to them all the benefits that I've just been, I've been, uh, I've been describing. The last compelling reason that I want to kind of argue uh, is, is the idea that urban greening is, it should be a really significant opportunity to engage with Indigenous history and culture. And at this point in time, I really would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, because traditional knowledge in this context is absolutely critical. Indigenous knowledge is, is very rarely used in planning, despite the fact that it has such obvious kind of benefits to cities and, and its surrounding landscapes. Um, there's, I think, substantial potential to engage Indigenous people in the, in the design, in the in the implementation and the governance of, uh, of urban forest and, and renaturing opportunities. What does this mean in practice? Well, in Melbourne, we're, we're looking at trying to rewild the city with species of cultural significance. The, the yam daisy, for example, a really important food source, a traditional food source. Or, or species that highlight um, cultural stories, or even this is a, a moth that signifies the start of one of the seven Wurundjeri seasons. And it used to emerge in vast numbers in Melbourne um, and wanting to kind of bring it back as a way of kind of reconnecting people with people the fact that Melbourne has seven seasons and, and this, is, this moth is going to signify the start of one of them. That's, that's, that's re-enchantment. Uh, playgrounds, nature-based playgrounds that kind of highlight Indigenous stories, and, and, and this is this, this one in, uh, next to the hospital in Melbourne is, um, is built around the seven seasons concept. Um, it's a really great place to take your kids if you're ever in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, and this is a project that we're, we're sort of um, kicking off as part of the Threatened Species Hub, which is to do with totem species in schools. So engaging school children in the traditional concept of, 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 of you know, having a a, a totem species that bestowed on the school, having to learn the science of habitat creation, of dispersal, and you know, how are we going to get this thing to come back to our school? How are we going to involve the community to be part of that solution? Um, understanding the cultural um, stories around totem species, which in my mind is one of the key reasons why we've kind of lost the plot with conservation, and the fact that that spiritual connection to nature it's, it's got to be part, so, much a, so much a critical component of, of why we care. Um, they'll look after you, you look after them. It worked for many, many years in this country. Let's, let's bring it back as a concept. Um, so yeah, I think it ticks a lot of kind of really excellent boxes, this Totem Species in Schools project. Uh, I'm really excited about kicking it off. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you that there are some very compelling reasons for wanting to bother with natural resource management, in particular nature enhancement in cities. But if for anyone who's actually worked in this space at all, the pathways to achieving this vision are not always straightforward. I think a really important first step in all of this is to challenge the way that nature is often considered in, in its entirety in the, in the planning process. So rather than, you'll often see biodiversity being talked about as a constraint, there'll be a biodiversity constraint layer, or you know, basically it's a problem to be dealt with, you know, how are we going to manage this problem? No, we have to stop using that language and removal of that language from the planning system. It is a massive asset, something we have to maximise at every stage of the planning process. Um, we need to carefully, obviously, carefully regulate to protect our remnants and to protect single trees. Uh, otherwise, we know how easily nature can be whittled away in cities and issues like public safety uh, sort of so, so, you know, so easily trump the kind of <laughs> idea that there's, there's worth in maintaining trees in cities. One of my absolute bugbears is the fact that our main instrument that we use to manage remnant biodiversity in cities is offsetting. Now, this is a complete policy fail when it comes to actually thinking about providing nature, everyday doses of nature. The idea that we can clear the vegetation in communities and offset it to somewhere that's going to be probably cheaper and usually far away from where people actually live uh, really misses that opportunity for people to connect to nature, to be re-enchanted by nature. So we don't talk about offsets, we talk about onsets. And we've developed a protocol called Biodiversity Sensitive Urban Design that seeks to, do, to take the nature that's existing on a site and enhance it through development. 
Now that may, may sound utopian, but we're doing this with some developers uh, in, in and around Melbourne at the moment. And because a lot of these environments are quite degraded to start with, it's entirely feasible uh, and, it's, and it's a really exciting concept. So our protocol is a scientifically driven um, protocol that's linked to the persistence of species and the viability of species and it links design, construction and habitation phases to tangible increases in the likelihood that things are going to persist on the site into the future. Planning for everyday nature means broadening our perceptions of what counts as nature. Scrappy bits of spontaneous nature can be as important to people as you know, quite intact remnants sometimes, especially if they're actually right where people are living and working. We can use habitat analogues in cities to provide, um, you know, uh, nesting and, and food resources. This is a really fantastic example of a brick that's used in a high-rise building, I think, in New York. And the birds can nest in this side and people can observe them nesting from the other side, inside the building. Um, we've been working a lot with architects, <laughs> which has been really kind of challenging and interesting. Um, certainly the fashion stakes are definitely, definitely raised. Everyone has extremely excellent spectacles when you go to sit in, <laughs> in <the> meetings. <laughs> um, but it's been a really exciting project, actually flipping the way that architects have often thought about buildings, which is about keeping nature out, into a, a philosophy of bringing nature back, inviting and making spaces for, not having spiky bits on the top of buildings for, to keep pigeons off, but actually having places for possums to live and exist, or birds to nest, and, and using that as a way of, of creating far more livable space for humans at the same time. One of these projects that we've just completed is actually, for anyone who knows anything about architecture, this is impressive. For everyone else, this will just sound like you know, really boring. But it's being featured as the Australian exhibition at the Venice Biennale. <laughs> um, the other thing we can do is really uh, think carefully about bringing species back into the city. This is something we're doing with the city of the Melbourne at the moment, helping them through a kind of decision model, come up with the best species that are going to be ecologically feasible, um, socially acceptable, and also this important thing of having you know, strong cultural significance. Um, this is a, such an exciting project to be involved in. Creating opportunities to, for people to engage with nature um, needs to be where they live and where they play and where they travel. Um, so, you know, obviously, we're always going to have important... The, the importance of remnant patches, big parklands and waterways is always going to be core to, to, to city kind of nature. But it's also about thinking creatively about streetscapes, for example, about backyards, green walls, green roofs, roundabouts, pop-up parks, schoolyards, transport routes, um, office courtyards. <laughs> you know, this is all stuff where we can have everyday nature. And there are so many creative strategies to achieving this. Um, we've, we've got a project on pollinator observatories. It's a really kind of cool citizen science concept around Melbourne. Wildlife gardening, this student of mine, showed the incredible aspects of peop people engaging with, with developing, with uh, encouraging wildlife in their own gardens. Better than going to a psychiatrist, apparently. <laughs> um, we can all be much better at engaging with different audiences than we usually do as, as natural resource managers or scientists. So, for example, we just published this little um, things that run the city. It's a children's book that came out of a survey we did of the insects of Melbourne. I mean, how much more boring can you get? This book sold a thousand copies. It's a kid's book that just has some beautiful artwork of the insects of Melbourne. Um, urban form is critical in this space. We need active, walkable streetscapes, buildings that are designed at the human scale, providing incidental everyday engagement with nature. So not this, urban sprawl, not this, massive high rise, not the infill that we see currently in the middle ring suburbs that are kind of really low yield in terms of extra houses, but massive impact on biodiversity and amenity. But this, sustainable mid-rise that has you know, semi-private spaces where people can feel stewardship of the land, designed so that people can yell out the window and see their kids. That's actually, that's a really strong planning um, <laughs> mantra. 
the kind of yelling out the window to your kids kind of rule. If you can't see them, you can't yell to them, then it's, it's not a good planning approach to actually encouraging everyday nature. It encourages everyday nature, but it's also extremely compatible with just highly livable and excellent communities for human habitation. Right, renaturing cities is not always going to be completely seamless. <laughs> and we need to carefully manage obstacles, problems and conflicts. Some architects and planners and engineers are not going to be used to this. And we have to kind of really work with them. This, there's so much wrong with this. This is uh, scientific pest and vegetation management. <laughs> I took a picture of it to kind of demonstrate the sort of attitudes that you can come up against. There's so much wrong with it. I mean, one of the things that I really wonder is, what are Ulysses butterflies ever done to anyone? But anyway. Well, the Corella Geddon hits Melbourne. I think this is the same thing that's happened in Adelaide, right? Oof, where to start? I mean, what if we, we lost the possums and the Corellas and the, you know, the, the things about our cities that actually make them uniquely Australian? Do we really want to have a city like any other global kind of place. I mean, I think this, though our wildlife is what makes our, our cities completely unique. Why don't we see traffic again, or, you know, relentless renovation again, or <laughs> bloody Harley Davidson driver again? You know, I mean, why do people kind of put up with all that crap, and yet Corellas are somehow kind of, you know, a massive, in, in, you know, totally... Anyway, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll calm down. I'll calm down. Let me finish. I just need to say that I, I've tried to outline really exciting possibilities and opportunities for what I think is kind of unleashing the potential of nature in our cities. Highlighting on one hand the, the kind of myriad benefits that designing cities for everyday nature have for people, and at the same time, um, you know, the critical role that cities have for, for maintaining threatened species. And I think that the future of our cities, the future of habitable, livable, fantastic cities that are Australian in character and nature and we can feel pride of place in, really depends on this new conceptualisation of urban landscapes where, where nature can thrive and people can enjoy every day the, the benefits that nature can deliver. Thank you very much.